Um, okay, our next speaker is a young man. I met him some time uh, back, uh, coincidentally. And um, he's here as well um, to talk about how we've lost touch with nature and what he's doing to try to reconnect uh, us to nature again. So let's welcome Linus. Uh, first of all, uh uh, my name is Linus. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I have to thank Calvin for this opportunity to uh, speak with all of you here. I mean, I'm, I'm amongst uh, really experienced people, and I'm probably the least experienced among here. Uh, I, I, started a, I founded a, a small company in Singapore. It's just me and a friend. Uh, we, we have an exhibition outside, a high-rise habitat. He might be sitting in here or might be outside. Um, so basically, um, why we started this was very much um, inspired by our concern for food. And today I want to talk a little bit about, about food. I'm not, not a very experienced urban gardener. I only started last year. So um, many of those, the, the speakers who've come before me and after me have probably more experience. But I'd like, just like to share a bit of what I know. So, uh, how do I do this? Okay. So I'm sure all of you know what this is, right? You recognize this plant? is a chili. Maybe in a few years' time, nobody will know what this, what this is anymore. But how many of you know what a chili plant looks like? I think many of you here know what a chili plant looks like, but maybe not everybody. See, up until like a, a few months ago, I always thought all chili plants, they had like the chilies dangling down, you know, because chilies are heavy or something. But actually, chilies grow upwards. And it's the same for, it's the same for ladies' fingers. I didn't know that until recently. Why didn't I know that? Because we, didn't, we don't see chili plants in Singapore very often. We don't see ladies' fingers plants in Singapore. But isn't it beautiful? I mean, some people think that in, in Singapore, you can't grow anything pretty or anything. But Singapore is the perfect climate for growing chili. That's why we like chili so much, maybe. And if you do it well, it, looks, it can look like that. If you ask most young teens how a chili plant looks like, I think they probably won't really know. How many of you have gone to a Thai fan stall and then you ask for naka Thai or naka Tongsi? Because you don't know what it's called. I think all of us have had that experience once or twice at least. And I think in general, the problem is, I mean, many of us don't really know much about what we're putting into our mouths or how they came about or where they came from. But so what? What happens when we don't know our food? It may seem like the problem is because you know, there's so much more food now. That's why I, there's so many things. I don't know everything. It's OK. But actually, worldwide, the variety of food has fallen so much. I mean, you've heard from Ben just now how many all, all these like, native varieties that we used to have, none of us eat that anymore. So we're eating, we're eating much less variety than we actually had before, than before. Don't believe me? I'll share with you a story about corn. So this is corn. Meet him. Meet corn. Okay? corn you actually, actually, you probably already met him before. He's, he's like in your soup. You see him in a supermarket. And actually, he's probably in every single of your packaged food. I mean, all the food that you see that comes in a packet. Citric acid, confectioner sugar, corn flour, corn fructose, corn meal, corn oil, corn syrup, dextrin, dextrose, fructose, lactic acid, malt, mono and diglycerides, monosodium glutamate, MSG, sorbitol and starch. All of this is corn-derived compounds. So all of that comes from corn. And you flip onto the back of any package, you probably see some of them. But before corn was like that, before corn met humans, it used to look like that. Thousands of years ago, before the encounter with humans, it was this like, skinny, crusty, hard plant that barely had any edible parts. This is called a teosinte. It's ancient corn. But it still exists now. After humans and corn met, humans helped corn evolve into something more similar to what we know today. Through artificial selection, cross-breeding, you, you take different types of plants, you try to cross-pollinate them, and then we got to this. Over thousands of years of continents of trade, and corn developed into all this like, stunning variety of colors. To, honestly, I think to turn a wheat that was pretty much useless to us into such a pro productive food was, was such a huge achievement. But how many of you have seen corn that looks like that? I think not many of you. How many of you have tasted it? Okay, I see, I see a, like maybe four hands, and including Ben, so <laughs> I, I've never tasted any of that. Maybe the, maybe the red one, and the, definitely the yellow one, but not the black and red one, and all these colorful ones. And there are more colors. They come in every color, basically. Why, why haven't we seen them? Because this is how corn is grown today. 
This is a corn field in the US, and it's just acres and acres of corn. And you know, it's just machines and, and like this gigantic fields, automated stuff. It's growing the same yellow corn. It's basically, this is the world's biggest factory. And I think it's great. It's great. It feeds many people. It's very affordable. And it's, I mean, it, it's very productive. But at the same time, it's quite a pity that I, you know, we lost all that variety, I feel. So the corn today we know is said to be the sweetest of all corn varieties. And that's probably why we like it so much. But we don't really know if that's our favorite, right? Because I mean, uh, until today, how many of you are still arguing, you know, like, uh, which katong laksa is the best katong laksa? You don't know which is the best until you tried all of them. You can't argue if, if, you, if you haven't tried it. If you've only eaten yellow corn, you can't say that yellow corn is my favorite corn. You have to try all the corns and then say that, actually, yellow corn is my favorite corn. So we don't really know. But the sweetest variety, interestingly, because it's so sweet, it's packed with sugar and starch, it, it doesn't have all the other nutrients. So all the colors that you see just now, all the colors represent different chemicals. They come from different chemicals, different nutrients, and we've lost all of that. Now we have this yellow, pale corn that just full of sugar and starch. So what happens when we don't know our food? We walk into the supermarket, we pick the potato that we think looks like a potato, we pick the carrot that's orange, and the corn that's yellow, and then over time, we lose all this variety. We, we stop understanding what real food looks like. We stop understanding what nature provides us with. We encourage farms around the world to grow the same thing over and over again that looks exactly the same and tastes exactly the same. We lose diversity, we lose nutrition, and we lose flavor. The story of corn repeats for all the plants, almost every single plant. And the food that we have today has so much more sugar, so much less nutrients, and much less diverse. In fact, like some estimates put it that we've lost 90% of food, our food diversity since 100 years ago. In Singapore, we take pride in our food culture. At least half of our conversations are about food. They say you are what you eat. But what are we eating? What are we choosing to eat? And how is that affecting us and the world? Okay, so in your mind, you're thinking like, Xiao, uh, I think so much for what? Uh, potato, then potato. La. You know, I got two types of potato. I got sweet potato, and I got a normal potato. Can already. But, okay, you don't care much about food diversity. Okay, how about an environment? Well, the most common way that we grow food these days is this thing called monoculture or industrial agriculture. And, and this, this results in so many problems, environmental problems, such as soil degradation, erosion, pesticide dependency, herbicide dependency, fertilizer runoff, eutrophication, blah, 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 blah. The list goes on and on. A lot of problems with, with this kind of mass-produced stuff. So because instead of be being custodians of nature, we made ourselves into the masters of nature. We push nature beyond its productive capacity and make it our slaves. And it's completely unsustainable. So some of you are going to say like, oh, hey, not my fault. Huh? Okay, but I think, yes, it's your fault. It's also my fault. It's all our faults. Because our collective demand, what every single choice that we make at the supermarkets, when we buy the food, we force the, cust the, the farmers to grow the food that we buy. And if we, if we choose food that is not diverse, we end up getting food that is not diverse. You know what else is our fault? Waste. I'm sure of you have heard on the radio or like ads and stuff like that recently, you know, they have this waste campaign. It's, it's incredible how much waste Singapore generates as a society. Not just Singapore, most developed nations as well. And you're going to say it's not your fault again, but I'm going to prove you wrong. How many of you, when you go to buy bread or you go to buy milk, you go to the shelf and then you go and reach all the way to the back and you go and see all the expiry date. Okay, this one is the furthest one. Okay, I take this one. Or you go, you go and buy your, your, your fresh vegetables, right? Then you see, okay, this one looks a bit rotten. Uh, this, one, the, this one got a bit of damage. Okay, I take this one. This one looks very nice. And then, and then you, uh, before you take it, you, you feel a few, you know, like, oh, this one, not very nice. So there's, some of them are going to be like, you know, 100 aunties, then they come by, and then they pick up the potato. They're like, oh, not, not very nice. And then they put it back there. So what happens to all those stuff that people are picking up and putting back down? Nobody buys it. And then the supermarket throws it away. So when we, if everybody picks the one that's the, the freshest and the, the nicest looking or the furthest away from the expiry date, then everything else that comes before that is going to be thrown away. So did you know that, another thing is, did you know that um, it takes 25 times more energy to produce one calorie of beef than one calorie of corn for human consumption? So actually all, these, all the vegetarians out there, you're already re using like 25 times less energy than me, because I'm still trying, my, I'm trying, trying very hard to give up meat. 
but it's very difficult, it's very tasty, but I'm trying my best. So instead, so basically, um, sorry. So every time I, I talk about this, you know, I can imagine my mom's voice saying, and she's like, oh, then what you want me to do? Okay, okay. I got, I got suggestions for you guys. Okay, try growing some of your own food. Why? Because when you grow your own food, you can reconnect on a regular basis with the fundamentals of what food is. When you grow a vegetable from a seed, you feel viscerally the time and the effort it takes, and all of a sudden you realize all this waste that's going on around you. And when you wake up to the smell of the mint plant in the breeze, you know, not the mint in your toothpaste, you, you will begin to realize that food can be so beautiful in all its shape and sizes, and, what, and that we can become custo custodians of nature, we can rejuvenate the planet. And when you've watched a pepper plant grow from a pepper seed into a pepper plant, and then it becomes a pepper flower, and then you get a pepper fruit, and that fruit looks a bit weird, it looks like a really dented or, or like spot or something, you recognize that sometimes food gets, food gets damaged and there can be imperfections. It can look weird, but it can still be nutritious and delicious. And when you grow your own food, you'll use all sorts of techniques to get, a, get, get rid of the pests and the weeds, but I'm pretty sure you're not going to use a single drop of chemical pesticide or fertilizer. And you know what's the best part? When it comes to harvest time, you suddenly realize that you have so much that you can't finish it all before it spoils. And then you can get to share it with your friends and your family and even your neighbors or even someone you met five minutes ago on Urban Gardening Facebook page. And then in exchange, someone shares some rare seeds with you. Seeds for a plant that doesn't exist on the supermarket. Seeds that you cannot buy. Seeds that someone else's grandmother kept over generations until today. And, and you get so excited about your next harvest because what will the plant look like? What will it taste like? What new food can you make with it? But you're like, oh, grow my own food. Oh, that's impossible. It's so hard. I, and you, and I think some of you saw like Thomas, Thomas's presentation. You're like, oh, I, cannot, I can't do any of that. Uh, and and whenever, whenever I give this kind of suggestion to people, they always give me three no's. No time. No space. Don't know. Okay, valid problems. I try to help you. I mean, every, everybody here is trying to help, okay? And this is just my, my solution. So me and my team at High Rise Habitat, we, we worked for a year to develop this system called Livia. It's a modular home hydroponic system. We managed to develop it with grants from uh, NUS Enterprise and, and our partners at uh, Singapore's first hydroponics farm, O Farms. And we designed it to utilize every single pocket of your space at home. So we're inspired by, by some of the growing techniques used at the farm and powered by their nutritious, uh, the, it's made in Singapore, the plant nutrient. And I like to say that growing the, growing the plants with, with this system is as easy as making a cup of coffee. Why? Because all you need to do, it doesn't take any time at all. All you need to do is you add the water and you add the nutrient and then you add a seed. So it's like you pour the coffee, you need to make, add the water and then you put a seed in it, right? Or you put the coffee powder and then you wait. After four to six weeks, you get a plant. Why does it work? Because the, the, the pot holds enough water for the plant to get from the seed all the way to the full maturity that you can harvest. And you don't have to worry about mosquitoes either because the, the, the cover is sealed. You can take a look at the, some of our prototypes outside later. So all you need to do is wait. I mean, if you, if you count waiting as a, as a step, then it's three steps. But if not, then it's two steps. Lah. And you can top it off with water easily in case like, it's very dry. So you need to add more water. And you can pour it anywhere on the lid and it will just drain in. And it's easy to wash because it's small. It's like washing dishes. When you, when you eat food, you know, you have, you have to wash the dishes after you eat food. So when you harvest food, you also have to wash your dishes. And if you're too lazy to grow even your own food, I mean, you can get, you can get uh, mature plants, you can put it into the system um, to make it a self-watering planter, and you harvest from time to time. But that kind of defeats the purpose of, of, of the system, which is to get everyone growing. So, for those of you who have no space, maximize your space. You can mount it on your wall, or you can hang it from the ceiling by the window to get the sunlight, or you can stack it up from the floor. We're also developing some LED systems to, light, to give lights to even the darkest corners of your house so that you can turn into productive spaces. But we don't really recommend it because you have to use electricity, it's not that sustainable. But then again, not everyone has a beautiful balcony, and not everyone has a, you know, has, has a yard. So, and I think it's good that everyone just gets involved, 
try, try growing your own food and that will take you to more places. And other ways, today I just re learned from Ben, you know, you can grow some stuff even without light. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, try that as well. It's very interesting. Oh, nutrition. Grow nutrition. Okay. <laughs> so, no space. That's not an individual excuse, actually. If you think about it, this is an excuse that we use as a nation collectively. All of us use this excuse. Why do we have so little food in Singapore? Because we say, oh, Singapore has no space. But... Why is it that food and water get such different treatment in Singapore? 50 years ago, we, we said that, oh, we have no water. We, we came from zero water, and today we are almost 100% self-sufficient on water. We are not really importing that much water from Malaysia anymore, actually. So how did that happen? Because we decided that we wanted to become water self-sufficient, and we worked towards it. Today, we are even exporting water technology to, we are respected worldwide for water technology. We are exporting it to other cities where you know, there are water scars as well. For food, horrible. We, we import more than 90% of our food. And you know, in, in primary school, I, always, I think all of us learn in primary school. You, know, they say, oh, three, you need three things to survive as a human being. You need air, you need water, and you need food. And we, we fuss about the haze. We like, oh, our haze. Uh, and then we fuss about water. But nobody seems concerned that you know, if one day our port is, you know, something happens to our port or our causeways, or someone blocks our ports or something, then we only have like less than 10% of our food and we're all going to die. So I have this, I have this vision for, for Singapore, and I hope that you know, one day we can do for food what we did for, for water. In the next 50 years, or by the time I'm 75, I want my grandchildren to rest assured that no matter what happens around the world, we will have the food we need grown right here at home. Just like how my grandparents work hard to make sure that, you know, right now I'm feeling so safe that every time I turn on a tap, I'll have water. It's a big dream, and I don't think this is something that we can do alone as a company. I don't, and I don't even think that this is something that all these companies out there are going to be able to achieve together. In fact, I don't even think that this is something that the government can achieve if they say they want to do it. No, this is something that we have to decide for ourselves. This has to be for the community and from the community. This has to be a ground-up initiative, a collective effort, and, for the co and to turn Singapore into this edible garden city. This is about decentralizing agriculture and democratizing food. So I have this crazy dream of building a better world and a better Singapore, and I think it begins with food. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, it's so inspiring that uh, someone so young um, is espousing the right attitudes because I think what we do need to do is take responsibility for our future and to do something rather than to outsource the blame to someone else. And it's fantastic that um, everyone's doing it in their own way. I've got some good news and bad news. The good news is if you live until 75, you probably, by that st stage, your life expectancy might be 150. So the bad news is you live to 150, <laughs> which means your CPF withdrawal will be about 150. Um, the other question is, are you designing that to fit into shoe racks or not? <laughs> yes, from yes, tomorrow. I think, I think I have to reconsider the design. Uh, but actually, it, prob it might, you know, I, I might go and take a look at the shoe rack. It might, it might just fit into the shoe rack. See? Yeah. Uh, we, we're actually not uh, selling it yet uh, because so it's just showcasing it, prototyping, yeah. yes. But he might do a uh, Kickstarter crowdfunding program. Uh, that's something that they're thinking of doing so that then everyone can get and, yeah, and help uh, a fledgling young Singaporean company kick off something. You know? Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much. Very good.